Gracious God, move in and through these ancient words that they may become your living word, so that having heard them, we will become your living witnesses. Witnesses to another way, a way of life, right here, and for each other. It's all things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are moving out of our ongoing conversations around the prophet Amos. I know some of you will be rather pleased. Uh, we have been through difficult waters. I encourage you to continue to look for those places. But we are moving into October and we're taking a different theme and talking about abundance. We live in a world that is based, uh, we are told, on scarcity. There is not enough to go around. So what does our faith have to say about this? So we're going to go to three different passages of Scripture. I will read them uh, all three in a row, and then we'll talk a little bit about what we mean by abundance in creation. Let us listen for God's Word. Genesis chapter 1, verses 24 through 31. God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind, and the cattle of every kind, and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over the wild animals of the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in God's own image, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, and everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. And then a portion from Psalm 104, verses 24 through 30. O Lord, how manifold are your works! In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Yonder is the sea, great and wide, creeping things innumerable are there, living things both small and great. There go the ships in Leviathan that you form to sport in it. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. And when you give to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are dismayed, and when you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. And finally, from the Sermon, Ma sermon on the Mount in, in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34, Jesus speaks. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow, nor reap, nor gather in your barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are they not? Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon, in all his glory, was not clothed like one of these. 
But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things, and indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive first for the kingdom of God and God's righteousness, and all things will be added unto you as well. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Today's trouble is enough for today. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So abundance in creation, there's a lot for us to talk about in those passages. My hope is that we don't head down rabbit trails, but stay especially focused on this issue of abundance. But you can't read the text of our creation stories without heading into waters that, well, maybe take us in a direction we don't intend to do. You see, this is the fascinating thing to me. I love our creation stories. The first one, that is. There are four. We can talk about that later. But that first particular one, did you any notice that the creation of human beings came after cattle? <laughs> after the creeping things on the ground that we don't like to find when we turn on the lights? in the kitchen, and you hear that scampering across the floor. We came after those things. And I think it's a reminder that we are not the center of the universe as much as we think we are. It was not even God's intention. And this idea of dominion over has been so, so misunderstood that we thought we could just destroy it because it's ours to use. What we missed was is that the God who created all of this laid it all out, said, take care of it like I would. That's what that meant. Instead of, we're going to use the earth as our trash can. And one of the troubles is, with this text, is it also becomes a battleground in the ongoing culture war. And so, many of you know, I don't have a lot of interest in this, because that's not why this text is part of our story of faith. It's not a science book. It was not intended to be taught that way. It never, ever, ever, ever was. And here's how I want to get there. Now, this is an odd old reference that was based on a book by Carl Sagan. Now, you can figure out how I get there, right? Some of you might have seen the movie Contact. Jodie Foster was in that. This goes back 20 plus years now. Now, you don't have to have seen this film or read this book to appreciate the scene that I'm talking about. They finally, we, we finally make contact with some being, something out beyond our realm of understanding, and they create a spaceship, and they basically give them the plans from these higher life forms, and we go, and they choose who are we going to send to represent the human beings, right? And one of the scientists who's chosen when they finally get there looks and sees and is overcome by beauty that we don't really get to see. And she says, they made a mistake sending a scientist, they should have sent a poet. Because only a poet could capture the beauty of what was going on. And that, friends, is what this creation story is all about. You see, to get to the true power of our creation story, we have to go back to the time when it came to its final form. And I know I've said this before, but we're doing it again. The people of Israel were in exile in Babylon. And they had to hang on to their creation story because the Babylonian people had their own creation narratives as well. And that one was called the Enuma Elish. And this was a very different kind of creation story. I won't get into all of the details, but basically the end result is that a bunch of gods in heaven go to war with each other. One of them is torn apart, and her ripped apart body becomes the foundation of the cosmos. And her blood is the lifeblood of human beings. Now, every time I read that narrative again, I think, wow, that explains things way more, way more accurately today than our own stories, right? 
that we as human beings in our very blood are murderers and killers and, and are given, if the gods are violent, so are we. That's what that story said. And the people of Israel said, no, we know a God who creates out of love, not out of destruction. So instead of arguing about whether or not this is science or whether or not we can prove all the things we need to prove as a people of faith, we need to go back and realize that wasn't the point at all. The point was to provide a story that says, no, death and violence don't have the last word, and they didn't have the first word. So when we talk about abundance, we have to start with the idea that God created us to be in covenant community, not just with other human beings, but with our very creation. That the creepy things on the ground actually matter to God. Even the ones we smash with our shoes. It's not just the Buddhists, by the way. These things matter to God and they're supposed to matter to us. It's the idea that we are not the center of the universe, but we get to participate in God's creation. And what we end up doing is hoarding. And this gets me to the passage where Jesus says, don't worry. Don't, don't worry. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about your clothing. Don't worry about your food. It sounds like in some ways the Bobby McFerrin song, right? Don't worry, be happy. Just ignore the, the destruction around us. Ignore the fact that our cities are not what they're supposed to do. Ignore the fact that things are not the way they're supposed to be. But that's not what Jesus is saying. We live in a time where of finite resources. We know that. 20 years ago, when someone said peak oil, they went conspiracy theorist. And today, that was part of the whole conversation going on when Scotland went to go and vote. Have we reached peak oil? No one goes, oh, you guys are crazy. Because they know. We look at California, we've got water shortages because there's just not enough water to take care of growing all the food as well as creating lush golf courses in the middle of the desert. We are running out of water. So we know that we can't just say, well, there's nothing, we don't have to worry about it. In fact, in some ways, I don't know if you remember this, when Colin Powell was Secretary of State, he said that the one most important thing that we needed to be aware of, coming the greatest security threat to the United States, was climate change. He was a Republican, in case you forgot that. We live in a time where we can't, we can't ignore the realities of our finiteness. So what do we do with that? How do we take these texts where Jesus says, don't worry, and put them alongside the, you better worry. If you don't go to work, you're not going to be able to pay your bills. And if you don't pay your bills, you're not going to have a place to live, clothes on your back, or food to eat. So you better worry. What do we do? But you kind of have to go out a little bit into the book of Acts. I know I didn't read that. You'll be thankful that I didn't because that passage is really, really long. Acts 4. The first Christians took these passages and said, okay, so how are we supposed to live in a world that doesn't look like the abundance that God talked about? And they said, oh, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to form communities and figure out how to live as faithfully as we can in these communities. What that meant was is everybody sold what they had whenever anyone was in need. They shared their resources together. They figured out that they might not always agree with one another. They argued a good bit with one another. Acts 15, you can take a look at that. It was a really long fight. And they didn't come to a conclusion where everyone was happy, but they realized that they needed one another. And the driving force behind this, and frankly behind what we're needing to do, is to start with the premise that there is enough. There is not enough for everyone to get what they want. We cannot hoard things. We cannot enrich ourselves while our neighbors go hungry. We cannot fill storage facility after storage facility while other people are going without clothing. We just don't have enough storage space for all of our stuff. John the Baptist said, give it away. You got two coats, give it to somebody who doesn't. Because we know that there is enough if we're in communities that believe in God's abundance. 
If we're giving up this idea that I've just got to save myself, then we're set free to live for other people. And that brings me to basically this final point. The truth is the most finite resource that we have is ourselves. I've said this before. Every single one of us is going to die. We all are. But the choice we have is to recognize that there is enough and to live our lives in ways that make a difference to other people. Giving of ourselves. When the Israelites went out into the desert, they didn't know how they were going to eat. And God said, oh, by the way, you see that worm over there that's secreting this little flaky substance? You can eat that stuff. <coughs> so, do you all know that that actually exists? In the Sinai Desert, there is a caterpillar-like worm that secretes this flaky substance that's like a honey, crusty bread, and when the sun comes off, it burns it up, melts it, and goes away. God said, you can eat that stuff. And they said, what is it? That's where the word manna comes from, which means, what is it? They never got an answer, but it was sustenance. There was abundance when all they could see was desert sand, and God said, there's abundance. Bruce Feeler uh, wrote a journey called Walking with Moses, and in his book, he recounts this journey, and along the way found out that this flight path, there's a flight pattern, historical flight pattern of pheasant, right through the desert. That, that the people in Israel or in Egypt would not have known that pheasant was a bird that you could eat. So they see these strange birds out there. God says, you know what? You can eat those. In fact, there's so many, you're going to get sick of the meat. Abundance, when all we could see was nothing. The truth of the matter is there is enough to go around. The question is, is we just got to figure out the logistics. We have to change our orientation. Because if we walk through the world saying there's not enough to go around, I'm going to get mine first. And you are on your own. Or maybe you get the leftover chance. As Christians, we're called to recognize that there is enough and then figure out how to make enough for all. That's our calling. We don't have to believe it. But it is what our faith tells us to do and to be. There is enough. That's easy to say. The hard part is figuring out how much we don't believe. Because when we walk out these doors, we are bombarded with other values. So those places in the back of your mind where you're going, yeah, that's nice, Pastor, it's idealistic, but not true. Remember that those voices, too, are trying to convince you that all of this is a joke. Something we do on Sunday morning, but doesn't really have an impact. Imagine a world just for a moment where people recognize there was enough to go around. And then we wouldn't have to militarize our peace, police, in order to keep some from getting more of a piece of the pie. Imagine if we lived in a world where we were living in a city that school system is falling apart but has two of the finest universities in the nation. Imagine that we didn't live in a zip code that has the hot, one of the highest rates of infant mortality in the nation, rivaling what we often call third world countries in the shadow of two of the finest hospitals in the nation. <coughs> it's because we don't. God says no. There is enough to go around. Creation was clear, and we messed it up, and we followed the ways of faith. Over and over again. So when Jesus says, do not worry about tomorrow, what he's getting at is that anxiety that drives us inward and away from our neighbors so that we can say, let's deal with today's problems and not worry about hoarding for tomorrow because there will be enough if enough of us truly believe and act and live that way.